Hello, uh, and welcome to Producer Hub webinar number three, uh, Green New Theater in partnership with Groundwater Arts. Uh, we are so excited to welcome you to this webinar. It's um, personally my favorite topic in our Producing Ethically series so far. Um, so it's uh, really exciting to have you with us on Friday, February 5th, or whenever you're watching this. Um, for those of you who are new to the community, I want to tell you a little bit about Producer Hub. Producer Hub is an online resource that supports creative and independent producers working in live performance. Um, but we are, and that means people across the whole board of the live entertainment industry, whether you've been practicing for years and years, or whether you're new to the practice, or whether you're an artist who is just curious to learn more, um, Producer Hub has a resource for you. Um, if you haven't had a chance yet, please check out our website at producerhub.org um, and sign up for our uh, sign up for our newsletter and you will get all sorts of exciting resources in your inbox. Um, our Producing Ethically in 2020 slash 2021 series is our first webinar series, uh, which is specifically talking about how we move forward into creating a ethical producing practice that for the future of the industry. We're super excited to provide these tools and do a deep dive into these topics. And specifically with Groundwater Arts, who was is also deeply connected to Producer Hub as one of our fiscally sponsored organizations. Um, they have created a document called Green New Theater that they have been working on for a long time and have been continuously uh, editing iteratively with community. And we are really excited to do a deep dive in it with you today. But before we start, I would like to offer a land acknowledgement. So I am speaking with you from Tucker County, West Virginia, which are the traditional lands of the Massawomack, Sapani, and Delaware peoples past and present. And if you know the tribal history of the lands where you are listening in from, we invite you to drop it in the comment section of the YouTube video. Um, I also would like to thank Groundwater, Groundwater Arts for their Zoom land acknowledgement, which we are also using today. Zoom, which is the platform that we're using to record this webinar, uh, and many other days, is headquartered in what we now call San Jose, California, on the traditional lands of the Ohlone and Tamian peoples. We acknowledge the lands Zoom resides on because the work we create together on a digital platform does not exist in an ether, in an imaginary void, but is made possible because of physical land and the indigenous people who steward it. So with that, I actually would like to take this opportunity to invite Groundwater Arts to join me on screen.
um, so holding for technical difficulties. Thank, Thank you, Eugene. <laughs> Thank you everyone for your patience. We are uh, just figuring some things out on our side. Thank you so much. While we're waiting though, I am going to share the Green New Theater document in the chat, if that's a useful thing to follow along with while we talk about this. Um, in other, in other news, um, hold on just one second and we're going to get that sorted. All right, so it sounds like sound is back. Okay, we're all good. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for your patience. Um, so, Brian, am I good to start? Continue introducing our groundwater team. Awesome. I'm going to pass it. Uh, Tara, do you mind introducing yourself real quick to our viewers? Sure thing. Um, he's Jay Tara Chochipkados. So, hello, everyone. My name is Tara Moses. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm also a co-founder. Groundwater Arts with these lovely ladies. Um, I am a citizen of the Seminole Nation of Oklahoma. I'm also Muskogee Creek, and I'm calling in from the Muskogee Creek Reservation and the site of the 1921 burning of Black Wall Street, or what is colonially known as Tulsa, Oklahoma. So yeah, so I, whew, I'm a director, a playwright. I am the producing artistic director of Tila Tulsa, and I am the co-artistic director in residence at Red Eagle Soaring, um, plus many other things. But today, just groundwater, <laughs> just groundwater. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Tara. Uh, and last but definitely not least, Anna Lathrop. Would you mind tell us who you are? Thank you, Sophie, and thank you, Brian, for fixing those technical difficulties. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Anna Lathrop. I'm calling in from the lands of the Lenape and Nyack peoples, colonially known as Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. Uh, I am a co-founder of Groundwater Arts, as well as a futures researcher and facilitator. And yeah, that's all about me for right now. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you. And we're so excited to have Groundwater here with all of your many hats intact. Um, and so I want to start out, uh, for those who aren't necessarily familiar with you, can you tell us, me a little bit about Groundwater Arts and the, who you are and the work that you do? Sure, I'm happy to jump on that. Um, so Groundwater Arts is a predominantly BIPOC, fully woman-led artist collective. Um, we shape, steward, and seed a just future through creative practice, consultation, and community building. And for us, a just future is really, you know, climate justice equals racial justice equals economic justice equals a decolonized future. Mm. That is beautiful. Um, and for so that we can establish a little bit of vocabulary with folks. Can you explain the specifics of what climate justice is and why it differs from sustainability and environmentalism? That's a whole well, that's that question is a whole webinar. <laughs> a in whole itself. webinar, I know. <laughs> Real brief. <laughs> um, I, I will I will attempt this really briefly, and if I miss anything crucial, I'm sure my other groundwater arts member, members will jump in. Um, climate justice is really the acknowledgement that uh, you cannot have environmental justice without racial justice. You cannot have racial justice without environmental justice, which also includes things like environment, uh, economic justice because um, ultimately all, of ju all justice, which has to be a core of your work, sort of well springs from this uh, division we have created between the land and people and history and the, specifically for Turtle Island, the history of this land and the people who uh, were either removed from it or brought to it and enslaved or who have settled it. Um, is there anything that my, my Co-founders yeah, would like to add. I'll, I'll jump in just for like to zoom out a little bit too. Um, the, uh, a difference in terminology around like climate change versus climate justice. Um, that sort of difference is about the disproportionate impacts 
of the climate crisis on Black, Indigenous, and communities of color, which has been studied for decades. It's like fact. There are disproportionate impacts on communities of color, on Indigenous communities, on Black communities. Um, so what we're talking about with climate justice is like when we think about responses to the climate crisis, justice has to be at the center. Hmm. If justice is not at the center of how we respond to the climate crisis. At best, the status quo of disproportionate impacts will be maintained. At worst, they'll be exacerbated. So all of the systems of oppression that exist in the world, racism, sexism, you know, like all the things, They'll, I, they'll either like stay the same, which is bad, or they'll get worse, which is, you know, even more bad. Um, so the imperative of climate justice uh, is, a, is a must. Like it just, it, it, we, we must have that as our focus as we move forward in addressing the climate crisis. Yeah, and the, the one tiny thing I'll, I'll add to that, just because I know that there are a lot of colleagues and friends who, um, really hold on to that language of sustainability and um, kind of like an eco, uh, like eco is kind of the core um, language for this work. And I think one of our core values at Groundwater is we're really um, working counter to the notion that, uh, that, you know, a lot of past environmentalist movements have had that is, uh, that holds on to this idea that humans are separate from nature. And if we're going to look at the health of our planet, like we are part of that planet. So seeing, you know, this kind of myth of the wilderness, which is an act of erasure when you really, when you're thinking about um, particularly indigenous people and also um, um, black folks and communities of color, you know, you have, everything is connected and you can't just, um, the the idea of the of the wilderness and of the planet as this thing to be saved that thinking cannot be held separately from kind of white saviorism and um the kind of mythology of manifest destiny the mythology mm -hmm. of american history as you know being a country of all these values when we have been a nation of slavery we've we've had slavery on these lands longer than we've been a nation you know so so just to say that there's a a real, um, you know, when we say that climate justice is racial justice, it, it is really coming from that place of you cannot actually address um, the climate crisis without having um, a racial justice lens, you can't do it. And then like the last thing I'll add really quickly, um, a sentence or two, is, is that the climate crisis came to be because of colonization. Um, it is here because of white supremacy it is here because of gross capitalism, which comes from colonization. And so in order to undo the crisis, um, we have to center justice. We have to center black and indigenous people. We have to uh, center decolonization in, in our works. And so sustainability, eco theater, getting rid of all your, all your straws, which don't get me started on the disability justice aspect of that anyway, is not enough and nor will it ever be enough to, to combat the crisis. Um, so yeah, just calling it as it is, being very plain and simple, the climate crisis is a direct result of colonization. So you got to send to justice. That, that's the rules. <laughs> um, amazing. Thank you so much for such a clear vocabulary dive with me. Um, because what I'm really taking away from this is how everything is an interlocking ecosystem. And at no point is anything... Um, is anything independent of other things. And we have to be able to take a holistic view in order to actually create a just future. Um, and the arts are a huge part of that cultural and societal and justice ecosystem, which is, it seems like that's what the Green New Theater document is sort of addressing. And so I'm sort of, what the Green New Theater, for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, which I hope after this webinar, you will, you will go take a chance to read it. It is free and published on the Groundwater website, but, um, it, it is an incredible toolkit. And I'm sort of curious to hear about how, about, um, what the core principles of that document are. Uh, and Tara, do you mind answering that for me? Yeah, not at all. 
Um, so the, the meat of the document focuses on six main principles, um, right relationship to land and history, decolonized leadership practices, community accountability, sustainable resources, immediate divestment um, from fossil fuels, oh my gosh, every time. Publicly transparent budgeting. There it is, publicly transparent budgeting. Just for the record, I was going through these again in my head right before we went live, <laughs> naturally. <laughs> Um, anyway, and so uh, the document was cr was um, created with the input of scores of artists from across Turtle Island um, because we firmly believe that the work that we do and create should not exist within the four of our brains um, and that the collective wisdom of the community is the only thing that will move us forward. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and so on the document, you can check it out on our website. Um, for more information, but those are the six principles. What else we want to say about the Green New Theater, y'all? Well, so I do, I do, there's so, there is so much more. Uh, and if you are interested in doing a deep dive, um, Groundwater Arts has already put together a call series that is on the HowlRound website, and we will share a link to that at the end so that you can do a deep dive into each of those core pillars of the Green New Theater document um, with them, which I definitely have, and it's incredible. Um, but I'm sort of curious to actually put the Green New Theater in a sort of larger landscape to the point of the ecosystem. And I'm wondering if, Annalisa, if you could talk to me a little bit about why you felt like this document needed to exist in the first place. I mean, do you want the whole like narrative of all the things? <laughs> Whatever how, much, you, how much do you actually want, Sophie? I mean, I <laughs> from you, I always want the full deal, but um, however much you feel like uh, it's useful for folks to know. Yeah, okay, why did this document need to exist? Um, I, I suppose I could start with saying that uh, I've always had a practice that was interested in the intersection of care for the earth and racial justice. Um, I didn't, I don't think I always talked about it as like climate justice organizing or climate, like, I don't know if I always gave it that language, but my practice has always been that way. And, and I've always, I've also for many years now had a practice that centered decolonizing. Um, and as I, as I was sort of like moving through the world and being in different kinds of spaces, um, I noticed a disconnect, a, a frequent disconnect between the people who were doing like decolonizing work and like racial justice work. And then the people who were doing like climate change theater or like eco theater and never the twain shall meet. And I was like, why, why th these should be the same. We should all be talking to each other. <laughs> um, and I would say that that is one impulse of like, why do we need a green new theater? Was there, there are sort of these like separate groups of, of folks who are operating and, and like, the Green New Theater document in many ways is an attempt to take the framework of a just transition and apply that to the theater industry. Hmm. Um, and let me stop there for now, but that there, there's a quite a lot more of the sort of like, how did the document come to be? But I think the why it came hmm. to be is about, um, incorporating decades and decades and decades of movement building work around this concept of a just transition. Like we did not come up with that. That's, there are black indigenous people of color, elders who have been doing this work for a long, long time. Um, and what we were sort of seeing was that there weren't many, there were, there were some, they were not getting a lot of attention, but there weren't many people who were like explicitly connecting just transition frameworks to the theater industry. And like, I just, I need to name um, and like give a shout out to Joyisha Dutta and Another Gulf is Possible. And like my friendship with Joyisha over the years has really helped me crystallize um, my understanding of the whole, of the just transition framework and what it even has to do with the arts. Um, so just, just to say there are people that have been doing this work um, and we are not, I don't want to position us as like inventors of a thing. Right. And, and I, I will actually say that one of the things that's really stunning about the Green New Theater document is how much you're honoring 
the legacy of the people whose work you're sort of you're you're bringing into one space and the frameworks you're bringing and i'm sort of uh, actually, Ronnie, I was wondering if you could actually talk about some of that legacy and how you're honoring it through Green New Theater, because I think that's a huge part of the community you're building as well. Yeah, so, and I, and I think honoring that community, we've been trying to do that in a number of ways. So to just um, connect it to one point to, I don't know, as part of our pacemaking too, honestly, that... Um, when you know, I first started having these conversations with folks. Um, I mean, I was initially with the Green New Theater document, kind of following, um, in many ways, Annalisa and Anna's initial um, writing and thinking, and kind of like bringing it through my own um, lens. And, and I started talking to people about it, and it was getting really excited about it. And there was this overwhelming sense that this work hadn't been done anywhere, and it was so radical. Mm. And then you, you know. It was just astounding to me how, you know, how much this work is being done, has been done, and often by Black and Indigenous artists, companies, leadership, and that work has been historically made invisible. So first, it feels like a major act of, uh, it would be irresponsible of us to kind of say, great, here are all these values, and here is all this wisdom in one place, and it's just coming out of our brains, because it's not true. And folks have been doing it successfully for a long time, um, just not predominantly white organizations that are the ones we're talking to. Um, I mean, let me be clear. We are not just talking to predominantly white institutions, but that's where the sense of newness often comes from. And that's mm -hmm. where the, wow, this is radical, um, I, I find is often coming from. So there, there's that piece of it, first of, first of all. And then, you know, in the, as Tara alluded to earlier, it was really important for us that this, this is not a document that we are hoping to just send out into the world and say, look, we did a thing. We hope that it's an active uh, tool, like an active tool for movement building and organizing. And we want it to uh, inspire and encourage change. So if that's gonna happen, four of us ain't it to kind of know if it's the thing, right? So, um, Part, you know, prior to us doing this whole how around call series, um, we really, you know, encouraged anyone and everyone, um, both through the TCG conference, through our own, you know, personal outreach, lots of other platforms to say, you know, get in and work with us, you know, on these different principles and contribute to this document. And we've, we are so eager and hungry to hear um, more and more examples of folks using this work. So then we can actually go back and edit the document and say, if you're curious about this, you really should, you know, see these folks doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and really then the call series was about, um, you know, shining a light on those partners, digging deep into the principles so that we're kind of demystifying, you know, what we mean by right relationship to land and history. Um, and, you know, the the community organizing and the honoring of others, especially honoring of those whose shoulders, shoulders we're standing on has been critical. Like there's, like it is one of the principles of the document, right relationship. And so, so, and that's, you know, that's something we'll talk about later, but it's really important to us that we are practicing everything we're preaching. Hmm. Yeah. I so also wanna add, sorry, if I may, that, um... I think there's been a lot, especially 2020, right? <laughs> Rough year. Uh, <laughs> but there's been a lot of sort of understanding of like what's not working. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes you get these visions of the future that feel very utopian. And it's like, okay, but how do we get there? Like, what does that look like? How do we get there? And I think Green New Theater is, is a bridge to how do we get there? And how we get there is also by honoring the legacies of the people who have been doing this work the whole time. And so really what we wanted to build with Green New Theater was it's not just a plug and play, pick up, oh, I'm gonna do this part of it and I'm gonna do this part of it. Like it's really sort of a whole, I hate, I'm gonna use the word holistic even though it's used a million times for a million di different reasons, but it's a really holistic view of how an arts organization or an individual can start to move towards that, that future that might seem utopian, it might seem unreachable, but, but really it's not. Hmm. Yeah, I think 
what I find really astounding about the document is that it is both a high level um, values led document, but also a practical toolkit for how to build a just practice or to incorporate justice and center it through relationship, through community, that at no point is a single entity or, or leader um, handing down how it works and how you move forward, that it is actually a document for, by, and about community and, and a collective wisdom, to use Tara's phrase. Um, and actually, it seems like what you're talking about is a really specific model of leadership for what it takes to move forward in terms of justice. Um, and I know from our prep call that, that there is definitely elements of emergent strategy, but, but I'm curious if Ronnie or Annalisa, sorry, I, we talked about this too, um, is for Annalisa, if you could talk a little bit about what this decolonized leadership looks like in practice and why it's so important to the whole, uh, for the whole movement. Um, yes, I definitely can talk about this, but I want to ask anyone to jump in because my brain is doing weird things. So I can't remember what actually I was supposed to say in this section, <laughs> I'm just gonna, like say what I think, and then please support me team. <laughs> um, so decolonized leadership, when I, th when I think about what that means, um, I think about, uh, not just one singular leader who is like charismatic and has quite a lot of prestige and all the power about decision making. Um, but I think about um, like, oh, this was the joke I made before. It's a little bit corporate speak, but like leaderful organizations. Um, and if you actually can achieve that, where the organization, everybody has a certain amount of autonomy for decision making and everybody knows what kinds of decisions need everybody to weigh in and what kinds of decisions you can just make on your own. Um, that, that sort of like power, that, that creates power sharing in a way that the traditional sort of top-down hierarchy does not. Um, it requires leaderful organizations or like power sharing or however you wanna sort of talk about decolonized leadership. It requires quite a lot of communication. It requires flexibility and time. Um, it, it, it like, but of its structure, it resists the structures that support white supremacy. Um, so it like requires a different relationship and orientation to time and a different relationship and orientation to communication um, and being really clear about boundaries and expectations. Um, and I'm gonna stop there, but th so that's that's my sort of intro to what I think decolonized leadership is, but I'd love to hear from anyone else. I'll add in something that I think is really vital. Um, and so talking about these like shared power, um, it is not a system where in the theater as an example, we go to the top of the pyramid and we go to the artistic director and the executive director and the board of directors, and then they decide that they're going to share their power out of the kindness of their hearts. That's not what that is. Thank you, it's thank you, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is the acknowledgement that the power is is within the community, it's within the people, um, and it is within the relations you claim to serve. And so thinking of it that way, which is what it is, um, <laughs> you cannot put power onto one specific person, one specific group when the same people where that power comes from include the indigenous peoples whose lands you're on includes the black folks who built the buildings your land like they sitting on um you know it includes the communities of color it includes disabled communities it literally includes the land the earth the water itself capital c community as i like to say and so that's what com the power comes from is community power capital C community power. Um, 
And so whenever we talk to folks about like decolonized leadership, um, there tends to be sometimes be a disconnect between the, okay, I with the power, I'm gonna share some, but I'm gonna keep some. No, we're completely reframing about what power is hmm. because power is not a commodity. Um, power is something that existed long before white supremacy came along, long before colonization came along because that power always existed within the community itself. And so I like to think of it as a returning to the indigenous life ways that were of these lands. And again, capital I indigenous, indigenous people from across the world, indigenous, um, and you know, not reliant on strict hierarchical structures where the, ba the, bottom, the bottom tiers feed to those at the top. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so in the theater, that is a radical <laughs> way to think for some people. Anyway, uh, but just to assure the, that this true definition of power, not power that's been colonized as we now know it, um, has long, long existed before Mr. Christopher Columbus has long, long existed uh, before Rome even. Um, you know, it's, it's this community-led power has existed for as long as the sun's been in the sky. So it ain't new, we promise. Uh, but just to be very clear about where power comes from. And can I jump in to put a, a sort of like underscore on a thing that Tara sort of glossed over, um, which I loved when you said this thing, Tara, where she included the land and the water in um, like our definition of community and where power lies. Um, if you're like, wait, what does that even mean? Like, how would you do that? <laughs> what does it mean to think of land and water as a leader? Mm. It's like, right, this, this is where decolonized leadership sort of uh, uh, holds hands with right relationship to land and history. If we're in right relationship with the land, if we're in right relationship with the water, um, if we think of land and water as part of our community, we can take cues from the water when it is like, I am sick. I need, we need to do something differently. <laughs> when the water is telling us, uh, you know, pollution is bad, it is making the water sick, right? Um, when these pipelines are, are destroying um, sacred water, right? Like, if we take our cue from the water, we consider the water a, a relation, a part of the community, then um, I, I'm like, my, my sentence just went out of my mouth. My mouth. Um, this is my brain tonight, everybody. Thank you. Um, but do you, do you sort of take my meaning? Like if you reorient to land and water as, as beings <laughs> that can communicate with us, um, that, that's how you sort of get to the mindset of, of thinking of them as, as also leaders. Mm. Yeah. And I mean, the only thing that I'll add to that, which is, so I feel like the one response that I've heard to this kind of framing is, oh, that's wonderful and beautiful, but that's a very different way of being than I'm at in my urban theater company. So this must not like apply to me. Um, and actually not the case. Um, there's so much in everything we just shared that even if it feels like oh, I don't even know where to begin, there's so much in the values of it that when embraced create so much more, so much more joy, good things, generative buy-in. It, it, it just is a gift that keeps on giving. So for instance, just even moving from thinking about a framework of being the authority to being an authority to thinking about positional power instead of being a prestige, like something that's bestowed on you as like, oh, now because I'm in this position of power, I have um, I have all these things. It's more, you are holding responsibility. You are holding accountability. You are more accountable. Just and flipping that, the script in those ways is really such a way to open it up. Mm. I think, I think it is what what you all are talking about is so important, partially because um, you're talking about leadership as stewardship in that way. Uh, and when we talk in our prep call, um, one of the first things that y'all said to me was that each of you in your individual practices as artists, as leaders, uh, have values about care of land and care of place and care of community, that, that those things are so central to the work that you do both with groundwater and in your own individual practices but that the spaces we inhabit, especially when we're working in Zoom and everything feels really digital, but the physical places that we are, are just as important to the way that we, that we practice in our daily lives and practice. And actually 
one of the things that is really astounding about the Green New Theater document is, is the way in which you talk about the physical space and how to use that space, specifically around, you know, how do you become a sanctuary space and create safety for folks? And I actually am curious, Ronnie, if you could talk a little bit about the importance of, of theaters as physical spaces and not just as inst cultural institutions. Yeah, I mean, there's, oh God. I know, oh, sorry. Start. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's, when, um, I think a, uh, a common, a way in which in 2021, I think mainstream society would have us believe that um, space and buildings are, um, are owned and they are owned by um, government entities, they're owned by private property and there is no, I mean, if you go to Canada, if you go to Australia, there's a very different relationship to land and history in terms of, like, there's, they're at a different point on their journey in terms of reckoning um, with colonization. And having a physical space means that you have a certain responsibility to the land, you have a responsibility to community, you have space, and there's a question of how are you going to offer that space? Because if, if you are accepting that the world as it stands now is not just, keeping your space limited to your own agenda is part of reinforcing current forms of injustice. So unless you're working counter to that, you're operating within the kind of the status quo. Mm. So, you know, one, one of the ways in which we've talked about kind of breaking that open is in thinking about uh, how to offer space um, responsibly, you know, like giving over, I mean, frankly, you know, giving land back to indigenous folks is always a great option. Um, and, you know, it's also about sanctuary space. It's also about handing over the keys to, uh, and, you know, asking those in the community, what do you need? Hmm. Because we have this resource. It's about being a community resource more than it is anything else. And putting that decision-making outside of those in the institution you know how do you you know i mean and, and you know i'm curious others want to jump in on that but that's where my head goes first is that sense of responsibility and relationship to land and understanding that buildings and land you know you can't separate one from the other i just wanted to sort of uh flag um something that we've been a word we've been using a lot that I think gets thrown around a lot that is uh, sort of becoming a, has become a catch on that is the word community. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, when we say your community, it's really who, who are you accountable to? And if you're an artistic director or a producer, and I ask you who you're accountable to, who can fire you? And your answer to me is the board or my donors. That's your community. It's not your audience. It's not the people who live around you. And if you want the people who live across the street who don't know what you do to be part of your community, then you need to be accountable to them and you need to be in relationship with them. And you know what Ronnie's saying about buildings and space is it's, it's not just about messaging or awareness building. Uh, it's also about follow through. It's about turning to the people who are across the street from you and asking you, what do you need? Not thinking I have a solution for you, I'm going to open my doors for a community potluck and the people who are going to show up are going to be the people who come to my shows. Meanwhile, the people across the street are the ones who are in need of food. Hmm. It's about turning to the people like who, who is around, who's actually around you? Who are you talking to when you produce a show? Who's in your audience? And we're, it's not like some abstract idea it's like you no know, who are the actual individuals who is physically taking up space in your seats who is coming to your you know in the year of 2020 your zoom your zoom productions like who who's actually in this conversation i think that something what we talk about community accountability and green new theater and something that i think theater needs to have a real reckoning with is who are we actually making this with and who's actually, who are we actually in community with here? Because I think the answer is probably not who you want it to be. And also, um, who should we be accountable to? Who should be in this community? 
I mean, if you have a theater that is in a predominantly black neighborhood and your audiences are 90% wealthy, white, over 40, you got a problem, y'all. Like your community is also within the physical space that you're building and that your art occupies. Um, your community also includes all of those you share resources with. So if your theater is pulling in a lot of power in these predominantly like low income neighborhoods, you're making grandma down the street not be able to use her oven at night, <laughs> right? And so thinking about who else are you accountable to? Like you're accountable to the footprint that you have in regards to resources and access as well in your community. And whatever you just like, you just keep going down that way. I think mm. <laughs> if we had a little mini worksheet, uh, people will eventually get to, well, then am I in community with everyone? in everything. Yes. <laughs> it seems like community is is about who are you in dialogue with at at every step of the way. Not only who are who am I sharing space with, but also who am I constantly adjusting to, accountable to in to your earlier point about leadership, about the sort of the top of the triangle. It's also about how are we constantly adjusting and talking to each other and serving each other's needs that it's not a one directional relationship when you talk about relationship with community it's not just here is a ticket see my show congratulations it's community it's also a, a really big part of that leadership model that you're talking about and practicing in community in relationship to the land and the people is also about listening and and being willing to take the time to do that listening um, so, oh, there are three different directions I want to go right now, um, because to talk about dialogue and, and community and, and the people, because I think we've talked so much about institutions, about people with brick and mortar spaces, but I actually am sort of curious if I'm not an institution, if I'm an independent individual artist, how does this world apply to me? How does this manifest? How does this, how can I do this work as an individual, a creative, independent producer or as a, as a writer? Oh, there's so many ways. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I would also love um, to engage groundwater colleagues to, to get feedback because we're all independent artists as well, mm -hmm. um, as well as, you know, you know, fraternize with the institutions on occasion or regularly, just depends. Anyway, um, so one thing that I really like to tell individual artists is, is that the power, again, all the stuff about power, but the power resides in the artist, not within the institution. The institution is nothing without individuals. So um, I like to tell playwrights because playwrights tend to have the most power at the end of the day. Although, spoiler, they don't want, they don't want us to know that, but we do, y'all don't forget, we do anyway um is you can put into your contract um, inclusion writers you can put into your contract that they cannot have any fossil fuel sponsor sponsorships to fuel mm. your production or else they ain't getting the rights and this is another thing i like to say um <laughs> um if a theater like a like an institution says no to these things that you're advocating for as an individual artist Number one, do you want to work with them anyway? That's a question. I mean, but also like number two, the institution needs us, especially those of us who um, are operating in the margins and have these marginalized identities that institutions are trying to collect like Pokemon cards. Like we have the power here and they need us. Anyway, um, and so I think like the power of contracting and negotiation is something that's not taught deliberately. Um, and then a really quick antidote I'll give around that, and then I want to hear about other folks' individual strategies, um, is, you know, recently up for a new position for myself here. I asked them where they get their funding from, um, and I said, cool, that's great and all. If you want to hire me, which I knew they did, um, we're not going to take money from oil and gas, and we're not going to take money from foundations who have made their wealth in the genocide in the murder of indigenous people. Like that's kind of counterintuitive to what we're doing here. So finance committee, we gonna meet, we gonna figure something out. Anyway, um, and you know, that that was that. It was non-negotiable. They said yes, and I said, great, cool. Finance committee, we meet next week. See you there. Anyway, <laughs> um, 
And so I think just like remembering that power in negotiation when you're in relationship. Mm. What about y'all, Anna and Lisa Ravani? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I was going to speak because this is the producer hub to the independent producer um, side of things in that, um, you know, at least with my um, octopus hat on, there are so many artists that we work with. There are so many presenters that we work with. And it is so possible and doable. And I mean, it's something that we are in the process of doing. And I've been in a number of conversations um, with APAP and others around the building of these. But uh, the writers that Tara was mentioning are also something that's really important um, as individual producers to think about what is part of the agreement I'm having with presenters? What is part of the agreement I'm having with artists in terms of that social contract? I mean, for a long time, you know, I feel like a lot of contracts now have sexual harassment clauses. And I feel like the world is expanding to include more of, um, you know, more of what we're seeing in terms of, um, you know, intersection, intersectionality writers and, um, you know, to Tara's point, um, inclusion writers. And every time that a presenter or an artist reads that and, go, and has to make a decision about what to do, that's one more step that the conversation is moved forward. Um, I think that, you know, we spend a lot of time earlier in the conversation talking about relationships and really being courageous around accountability. And I think that we can see in the strength of our relationships with each other in the arts field, how much currency we really have whenever we bond together around shared values. I mean, when we all collectively st take a stand, it can be incredibly powerful. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really heartened by a lot of the um, mobilizing that's happening in response to um, Emily Johnson's letter um, in Medium. There's efforts that are happening both amongst presenters to develop systems of accountability. There's solidarity happening among artists, you know, to come together and, you know, make a statement um, with, with teeth, with action. And that is so needed. And that's, I mean, there's, there's researchers left and right who will, you know, who can tell you this a lot better than I can sitting here that, you know, social license, you know, social pressure is so incredibly powerful. And instead of letting it um, be harmful to our society, we can instead use it for positive good. Hmm. To Ronnie's point about social pressure, the thing, my impulse always um, as an individual artist, when I'm like, ah, I run into a problem, my impulse is always organized. <laughs> I'm like, go get more people. I'm like, I, I myself maybe cannot, um, uh, have a huge impact in this one instance, but if I like go get my friends, if I go, if we go like found groundwater, then, then like there starts to be power. If we like, you know, create spaces that don't yet exist to address problems, um, that's where I think individual artists can, um, you know, create the world that we want to live in and like build power outside of institutional spaces. Hmm. Um, and that's like, that goes for um, when we're addressing issues within the field. And also, um, I tend to uh, put myself in relationship too with like non arts um, organizers. And I will like show up as an artist to um, community organizing meetings and, and like offer artistic skills, right? To, to planning direct actions or, um, you know, a strategy in uh, community organizing is like dr uh, dramatize the conflict and create a, um, a dilemma for a person with power to respond to that makes them look bad either way, um, right? <laughs> um, do you, am, I, am I being too, um, am I not being specific enough? I can give an example if I need I to. love an example. example. Yeah, 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 okay. So um, an example of what I mean by creating a d decision dilemma is, um, Years ago, I met some some folks from an organization called Liberate Tate, <laughs> um, and that was a group of or artist activist organizers who were addressing um, fossil fuel sponsorships of the Tate Museum in the over in London. Um, and in case you didn't know, it used to be that BP was one of the lead sponsors of the Tate Museum, and the BP logo was like slapped all over the place. Um, and so 
this group, this group called Liberate Tate did a whole bunch of direct actions where they, and they were artistic. <laughs> um, they did things like um, dropping oil, not oil, it was black paint, but black paint on some of the statues in the Tate Museum that were, or around the base of the statues um, mm. that were um, taken from colonized countries and like put in the Tate. Um, to sort of dramatize the the issue of oil money sponsoring colonial violence and and sort of like putting on display colonial violence. Um, and I learned from this group that one of their many preparations for doing this direct action was that they they um, got in with the museum janitorial staff because they were the people that were going to become responsible for cleaning up the mess. Um, so they, in advance, built relationships <laughs> um, with the black and brown staff who were going to be responsible for cleaning up that mess and got buy-in before they just went and did it. Um, and the, the press about that moment created a decision dilemma for the, the leadership of the Tate Museum about how do they respond to this. If they don't, if they like, if they uh, come down on the side of, um, telling the organizers to go away, they look bad. If they don't do anything, if they like say, okay, I'm gonna, um, we're gonna drop our sponsorship, then they look bad to be people. Like, do you know what I mean? Like it, it creates a moment of tension that the leadership must respond to. Um, so, so that's what I sort of mean by artists can get involved in using our skills to dramatize the conflict. Hmm. Amazing. That is so useful to think about how we as artists can create power and, and opportunities for community building, relationship building, and dialogue and movement. Um, before, I ask, before I go the next direction, because I'm so excited to ask this question, I want to let folks who are watching know that now's a great time if you've got questions about some of the things we've been talking about, things you want to ask the groundwater team, please drop them in the comment section of the video and we will, um, we will start to answer them very shortly. Um, super excited to hear what, you, what you're curious about, but I am curious about, a lot of what y'all just talked about had to do with, how, with resources and funding. Um, and I'm sort of curious if we can talk about, about how we use resources, about how we choose what resources, funding, foundations we work with uh, as we pursue a climate justice. And Anna, I think, I think I'd like to ask you that question, honestly. Can you talk to me a little bit about the money? I would love to talk to you about the money. So the first thing uh, that I think we all need to make sure that we're all on the same page with is that uh, there is no money that is non-political. All money is political. It is energy and how we choose to direct that energy, where we get it from and what we put it to are a set of political and ethical choices that we make. Mm. So with that, knowing that, um, you know, one of the principles, there are two principles of the Green New Theater document that really talk about money very explicitly. Um, I'm not, money is like, I get it. If we, we want to run institutions and we want people to be able to pay their rent like currently we live in a colonized capital capitalistic society we need people need to get paid um publicly transparent budgeting is really about being accountable to where you put your money where does the money go out right who gets paid what why is the uh artistic director for example of a theater that I worked at in New York the artistic director gets paid about $112,000 and I got paid $10 a day there's a bit of a discrepancy there I don't know um why why is there that discrepancy you know what what are you saying when you're talking about decolonizing your power and then you're paying the person at the top I haven't done the math, I don't know, a thousand times more than you're paying the people at the bottom. So publicly transparent budgeting is really about, and this is a term that I learned from Ronnie that I love, values-led budgeting, and really sort of literally putting your money where your mouth is. Another way, so that's money going out, right? Now money coming in, we uh, talk about immediate divestment from fossil fuel interests and sponsorships because currently the arts culture is giving these companies a social license to operate. What do I mean when I say that? It means that 
companies that are doing things that are bad and destroying the earth don't want to look bad because, you know, then people will take action against them. So they give money to theaters, they give money to ga arts galleries. Uh, you saw this recently with the Sackler family, um, giving money to, let's say, the Whitney. So they will have a wing with their name on it. And people will look at that and be like, wow, the Sackler family, that's so incredible. That's so wonderful that they would do this. Uh, and then they are given a social license to continue to do what they do. So mm -hmm. BP at the Tate, by having their name all over everything, BP is seen as a supporter of arts and the culture, which is seen as a social net good. So they must be doing something right, when instead it's just reputation laundering. So when you choose to take money from fossil fuels and sponsors, even if you don't put their name on it, like we saw with the MIT Media Lab and Jeffrey Epstein, even if it's anonymous, you're still aiding and abetting that behavior and you're still ultimately part of the problem. It doesn't matter if you're doing climate plays about saving the polar bears, if you're taking money from the people who are not just killing all the polar bears, but killing also the indigenous people who live on those lands, killing the frontline communities. I mean, it's, it's, all, it's all very connected. And so, you know, we've talked a lot about being in relationship with and right relationship, right relationship to land and history. I argue we also need to be in right relationship with our money. Hmm. I think Preach. also just something to add on top of there, um, just a reminder to folks is that the revolution will not be funded. <laughs> yeah, just a reminder, um, because everything that we're speaking about is in direct opposition to the institutions of the people in this country who've had the most for the longest. Um, also, folks um, who are listening at home, that is a wonderful thing to Google for more resources. So the revolution will not be funded. There's plenty of, of like printed materials, articles, books, wonderful minds. Go look. Um, I'm also on the YouTube comments. I'll put it in the comments for you all after this. Anyway, <laughs> um, but also something to think about, too, is um, like pooled community capital. Um, there are like countless, countless studies and examples that show um, that community members who are truly invested in what you're doing, even though they may donate super small amounts of five dollars, two dollars, mm. fifty cents, etc., um, it's been proven that <laughs> campaigns and processes like get overfunded because they have community buy-in and so um whenever we move our mindsets from a mindset of like the scarcity mindset meaning that there is not enough for everyone and there never be enough into a mindset of abundance which is the community has always had enough and will continue to have enough um and truly embodying that and how we fundraise and how we think about funding what we're trying to do then again, we're moving towards a more decolonized future. We're moving into, in a way that's in alignment with our values. And we are um, decentering these pillars of colonization, capitalism, and like literal genocide murder, <laughs> lots and lots of people. Um, and then Annalisa just wants to add very quickly about wealth distribution, who's she? <laughs> wealth redistribution, who is she? <laughs> Um, so I want to zoom us out um, from this conversation that we've been having, but stay on the topic of the money. Um, and we've already sort of said over the course of this conversation that um, the, the global economy that we live inside of that's driven by the fossil fuel industry mm -hmm. um, it, it's it's out of whack on a scale that is actually incomprehensible. Um, the, the like the the accumulation of wealth into the hands of like three people <laughs> um, is it's unconscionable and it's it, it, it will it will actually kill the planet. It is doing that already. <laughs> Um, and so in order for a just transition of the global economy um, from an extractive economy to a regenerative economy, in order for that to take place, wealth redistribution is necessary at a scale um, that is 
it's like actually hard to imagine. Um, and if, if the framework of a just transition is new to you and you're just hearing that for the first time, um, one of my favorite graphic representations of what even is that, what does it mean? Um, if you Google movement generations, just transition zine, um, there's a really lovely visual representation in that of how to go from extractive to a regenerative economy. Um, and part of that transition from one to the other um, is it is necessary that we redistribute wealth. And what does that mean for the theater? <laughs> um, imagine, imagine a world where instead of relying on um, these donors and foundations where wealth has been accumulated and accumulated and accumulated, and we are then making programming decisions, um, even if we don't like to admit it, that are deeply influenced by these foundations and these donors. Um, imagine a world where those the foundations corpuses get spent down and the wealth gets given back, like the land gets given back. This, the, um, imagine a world where the Bezoses of the world, um, the, the wealth was like actually given back to the people. Um, that would mean for the theater that normal everyday folks um, would have, like it would necessitate that normal everyday folks would have more money that they could then choose to direct toward art that they actually care about. And like, then that leads us back to um, the conversation that we had earlier about the people who are right next door. I'm like, why do they not care about your theater? <laughs> why do they not, you know, why are they not coming? <laughs> um, and so the, the sort of like, if you zoom back, theater theaters exist inside of, um, the, the regional economy, the national economy, the global economy, and you can't separate it out. Like all of these things are, are interlocking with each other. Preach. Um, uh, this, this is incredible. And actually we have a couple of questions from our audience about some of the specifics about how we sort of put our values into practice. And um, from Adam, his question is, he would love some examples of the verbiage to include in show contracts for climate justice, especially like not working with fossil fuel companies and specifically regarding enforcement. Like, how do you put that in a contract? Who, uh, I can take it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, funny you should say this because um, we at Groundwater were actually working on some very specific uh, verbiage to put in show contracts. Um, but some um, one of the things that um, there are a lot of different ways to parse divestment, right? That that mean that you can take action now. So it could be um, that a, a contract could say something along the lines of. That no, uh, that there will not be any um, fossil fuel um, sponsorships of this specific of this specific production. That's one. You could say, while I am under contract with this organization, there will be no new fossil fuel sponsorships, donations, etc. That's another way. You it could say something like, there will no longer be. Um, you know, you could go even farther and kind of call in um, uh, banks that, I mean, and this is uh, this is a bit tough because I think a lot of theaters in this country um, have major bank CEOs on their board of directors. Those banks get billions and billions of dollars to fossil fuel industries. So there is um, really what to put in the show contract, and this is something we're working on at Groundwater and we'll of course share openly once we have various language, but, um, it really is about what is the conversation you want to tee up and what, you know, and make it a conversation, right? So if it's about um, wanting to enter into a dialogue to have reflection about where the funding for the show is coming from, you could just as easily say you want to have a certain level of budget transparency, hmm. you know, so that that could be the, you know, the first step. So it's not necessarily a one size fits all. Um, but it can be, um, and like Go Fossil Free has great um, examples of this language as well. Um, 
Uh, and in terms of enforcement, um, I, you know, my, my background, I, you know, spent some time in um, consensus building and facilitation. I find that it, when you're talking about enforcement, it's great if there's a way to find a third party partner that you could say in a contract, like, if there is a concern that there has been a breach, then X outside party will be referred to, to look at, you mm. know, um, various, you know, you can kind of take someone um, to be in a position of trust outside of that process to do that work. Mm. And I mean, and just to say, there are a lot of folks who are interested in having these conversations. These conversations are happening. You don't have to feel like you have to do it alone. Um, and it's something we're happy to be in conversation about. And over to you, Annalisa. Well, hilariously, that last sentence was the thing that I was just going to say. So you did it. Um, but to, to underscore it, it's the, the thing of um, one individual contract um, might not be the thing that changes an institution in that one moment. Um, but as Ronnie said, um, the dialogue, when you start that dialogue, um, that is actually good. like the next time it happens, the next time an artist walks into that institution and they're like, what about fossil fuels? And then, and then if, even if the institution doesn't budge the second time, the third time, you know, the fourth, the fifth, if, if, if we actually are building a movement here where artists across the field are like, well, okay, XYZ company, I don't want to work with you unless there's no fossil fuels, then, then like the institutions will start to have to respond. Um, so again, my impulse always to organize um, and build movement, then that is the thing where we actually are going to start putting pressure on institutions to respond to us. Yeah. Um, and we've seen that in various ways over the last, the last year with all of the different sort of pockets of organizing happening across the theater industry. When we band together, that's when institutions start to become afraid of us and start to respond. Right. Um, which is amazing to think about how we as artists can, again, collectively organize our power to, to sort of lead with our values, which actually goes in line with our next question from our audience, which is how do you still encourage institutions to work towards climate justice when they cannot 100% comply or are even resistant to what you include in contracts? So I know we sort of talked about this, but I'm curious, um, if anyone has anything they'd like to add as ways to encourage institutions beyond just contracts. Yeah, I mean, one thing I'll say just as a, a value that's important to me is that I find that one of the biggest obstacles to this work is fear of being a, a hypocrite. So, you know, if I'm not, um, if I don't have all my T's crossed and all my I's dotted, it's going to be so hard for me or my institution to move forward and to be vocal about this and to try to work it out if I have any, you know, uh, skeletons in the closet. And I mean, and the, the thing is, everyone has skeletons in their closet. Like that's why the potential for change is so great, right? So I think it's, um, you know, there is a, it is totally possible to be strong with the ask. Uh, so, so I guess I'm kind of like switching up the roles here and whether like I'm talking from an institutional or, um, you know, an artist framework. But um, it's all about taking the step that you can that is the next step. Hmm. So, you know, if an institution's like, ah, we can't, you know, totally divest, that's, we have this, 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 and this in the works. It's like, okay, well, can you say no new, like no new um, commitments? Hmm. You know, can you say that you're moving towards divestment in X, Y, or Z way? Um, yeah. And I mean, and I would also offer that, um, a big thing that we've seen is that climate justice is still not seen through that lens, right? It's seen as, well, there's this climate crisis and we should talk about it. And there isn't this sense that the transformation that's going, that organizations are going through, talking about becoming explicitly anti-racist, you know, um, how can all those organizations that are doing anti-racism work actually understand that climate justice is, a, you know, a linked lens? Hmm. And you know, even having the conversation of making those connective tissue points um, and opening that up is such a moving the ball forward. Because I can't tell you how many times we're, you know, it's like, well, what does colonization have to do with the climate? And it's like everything, 
but it you know it, it feels a little bit like the matrix that once you see it you can't unsee it um but it's yeah i mean i it goes back to emergent strategy which everyone should read always that like small is all however you move the ball forward is moving the ball forward having the conversation is moving the ball forward yeah and i think we'll also add for folks out there who perhaps have power within the institution you know, as a fellow leader of two institutions, let me talk to y'all. Um, yes, like absolutely take the steps that you can now. It is much better to get the work started um, and make mistakes than it is to live in fear and try to do things perfectly because the four of us make mistakes all the time. <laughs> People who've been doing this work their entire lives also still make mistakes. Anyway, and so if you like, for those within the institution, if you live in these positions of fear, you're never going to move forward. And also furthermore, I just wanted to reiterate that um, this is uh, not a sprint, nor is it a marathon. It is a lifelong 24 seven, 365, sometimes 366 days a year until, the, until you're no longer here. It is an everyday action. It's an everyday movement towards education, towards changing, towards growth. And also like y'all don't get no gold stars. We ain't getting no gold stars, no pats on the back for doing something. Like there are no benchmarks. There are no like you get a balloon, you did a good job. No, like it is a complete shift of how we exist. And so I think whenever institutions, my fellow folks who work within the institutions, um, can come to terms with that, it becomes a lot easier to take that first step and then the second, then the third, mm -hmm. then the fourth. Um, and so I would just find that's also really, really helpful for reframing, you know? Um, but man, fear, fear is a powerful thing. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and to talk about how accountability plays into that is if we hold ourselves accountable is, is, to con is part of that process as part of the steps that we take to move forward is to hold ourselves accountable for past actions, present actions, and how we move forward into the future, right? And you were just talking about that first step, that second step, but a question we have from our audience is sort of what is a good first step for that artist can take after this webinar? Like what is step one, or at least a couple of step ones? It sounds like there are a lot of different places to start. I, I love this part. I mean, <laughs> I'm always like, there's always a thing you can do. Um, so, uh, you know, the nerd in me, um, uh, because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a producer, uh, is what are the ways in which you can be transparent that you are not? Have you thought about who your community is and how you can be more accountable to them? Do you know Indigenous people? Um, I mean, and I, I really mean that. I mean, like having a living relationship with indigenous people so that it is not a statistic, it is not um, land acknowledgement is not a, um, well, that seems like a good thing to do. So I shall check that box. But really understanding that uh, the his history and the present are not two separate things. And, and history is not just, it's done. And now we live in this magical evolved post-racial America. Um, it's not, I mean, I think we've, um, you know, learned over the course of the last four years how uh, the wounds of, you know, the last multiple hundreds of years are still very present. Mm. Um, anyway, but that's not going to specific actions. Anyway, so, but knowing and building real re non-transactional relationships with Indigenous people for no other reason than really building authentic relationships, not having a reason to ask, not having a thing to, you know, um, a program to want to slot them into, just building community. Um, and, you know, taking steps for yourself about towards divestment, right? Mm -hmm. If you're an individual artist, thinking about what is going to be part of your contracts, what, how you want to talk to your agent, if you have one, if you're part of an artist collective, you know, can you can that artist collective divest and make a very public statement about that? How can you actually be part of a campaign hmm. um, that's about, you know, divesting? Every one of the, you know, spoiler, every one of the Green New Theater principles has in it a place to start. Hmm. Um, and, you know, I'll speak for myself, like this is not work and a framework I had even three years ago, you know, and it has been, it, defining the places where my values and the values of this work 
have overlapped has been really joyful. And that's the thing. I mean, I feel like with a lot of this, it's we've been having like some, a lot of this stuff is hard. It's about doing, you know, work. But it also like the reason we're doing this is because of all of the is because of all the joy that results when in those moments where you really see it in action and it's really awesome. Um, and Anna, I'm gonna I'm gonna punt it over to you. Yeah, yeah. I just um, as a white person, as a person who is uh, descended from a settler legacy in the United States, I think there's uh, a <laughs> plenty of fear. Um, but one thing I will say is that I think as a white person, you have we have more work to do. Um, and that work is, you know, there's a lot of sort of discussion about um, the emotional labor that BIPOC folks have been asked to do for free uh, for the benefit of white folks who are, you know, just trying to learn. And learning is great. Emotional labor is not. So uh, I would really, this is going to sound maybe simplistic. If you're confused about something, Google it first. There's lots of people online. There's lots of people on Twitter who are freely giving of their knowledge. Look at them first before you turn to someone and, and ask them to share their lived experience, especially if you're asking them to possibly share their trauma. Um, another thing I will say is that there's a lot of self-reflection that needs to be happening with white folks. And look at try and look for moments where you're centering yourself, centering your feelings, and then try very, very, very hard to not do that. Um, and it's uncomfortable. It's contrary to probably a lot of the way that you have been raised, especially if you are, uh, you know, the recipient of multiple privileges from your uh, ability to your sexual orientation to, uh, to all kinds of things, your socioeconomic class. But it's really important. I think there's there's lots of work that we as white people have to do. And we cannot ask someone else to shoulder that burden for us. We cannot, or well, I shouldn't use the word burden. We can't ask someone else to do that work for us. Mm. Um, and we can't compound trauma by, by throwing our feelings everywhere. So reflexivity, reflexivity is key. I think like something else I wanna add in there um, is also about proactivity. Um, so something that I have noticed as these conversations have continued and have grown um, is, is that I get a lot of well-meaning people, and I should be specific, well-meaning white people, um, into my DMs, into my emails, asking me to explain things to them um, that I've already done in countless panels and countless green water, groundwater arts calls, in countless articles I've written, that count, like countless books other people have written. And so um, whenever you're thinking about like, what is that first step? Again, just to reiterate, none of this is, is building the wheel. The wheel done been built. We got trains, we got wheelbarrows, whatever you want, we got it already. Um, anyway, and so I think re a wonderful first step is leaning into the wisdom of your community and of your community that you may not know is of your community. You know, even right now in this, you know, this time that we've been together uh, with Producer Hub, we've mentioned multiple resources. I dropped two links into the chat. <laughs> uh, the Movement Generation Zine, I dropped it in there, as well as the Revolution Will Not Be Funded. Go Fossil Free, I'm going to drop drop in there um read those are read it <laughs> that's a wonderful first step like whenever people like not just us but all like all kinds of people share these resources say hey you should look up kimberly dr kimberly crenshaw whenever we're talking about intersectionality like hey you should look up adrian marie brown like do it and you know I, so much of that has just been handed over and so i think being very proactive in your first step especially when you don't need to work that hard it's first steps second steps 25 steps have already been outlined for years and years and years and it's available for free on the internet um very few have paywalls but i'm sure you can afford it if, if you have questions anyway um it's just something i want to reiterate and my two cents for like, what's the next step that you could take? Um, I go back to my always impulse to organize. <laughs> um, and uh, just to suggest like whatever location you're in there, 
is inevitably environmental threats are to your to the location that you're in whether it's fracking that is like on the table for for happening whether it's pipelines whether it's incinerators like here in baltimore that are spewing chemicals into the predominantly black neighborhoods um whatever there, like there are different environmental threats and hazards that do exist in your neighborhood um and there's probably already community organizing taking place um, to address those threats and those hazards. Um, so if you start to Google things like your location and environmental racism or your location and climate justice or your location and fracking or your location and whatever the sort of things are, um, that'll help you find the people that are already organizing. So show up to those meetings uh, and listen first uh, when I go to community organizing meetings that I don't have relationship with yet, I'll show up and, and make a point of, of like introducing myself and trying to listen before I offer anything. Only listen. Um, and I at the second meeting that I'll show up at, that's when I might offer something that I can do. But I, I'm really just going to listen first. Um, so organize. <laughs> I think one last offering I will make is that if the great first step is to go to the groundwater website and read the Green New Theater document, which I can't believe that none of you said, um, it is an incredibly re an incredible resource and also honors the legacies that it is that it is pulling from. So that it is a great first step. In if you are looking for a ways to deep dive, there are links. It's all very clear, um, as well as the. Um, as well as the as the groundwater uh, green new theater call series on HowlRound, um, it's just a great way to sort of deep dive with this incredible panel uh, and organization that you've we've got, I feel like I've gotten a master class this evening. So thank you, um, thank you, thank you. Uh, I I want to also uh, ask folks if you can to just subscribe because they have some, I can tell you they have some exciting things coming down the pipeline. I know that Green New Theater is phase one uh, and, and there is a phase two coming soon. So if you are interested in this work, which you should be because it affects you, um, I, I highly recommend staying in touch. And is there any other way folks that, that people can stay up to date with what's going on with groundwater? I would really recommend uh, for those of you on social media to follow our Instagram and Facebook. That's where a lot of our information goes out. Um, we will be announcing on Monday, we have a series of workshops coming up about decolonizing theater basics. And we will be running a decolonizing theater intermediate. I don't know, we don't, we don't have a name for it. It's, it's, it's the step two. Um, that will be running after that. So if you're interested in that sort of like, what's a longer deep dive, just follow our Facebook, follow our Instagrams. I don't know, send us an email. Uh, we can drop our email into the YouTube comments. Like we just, please, please keep in touch. Yes, we have a newsletter. So I'm putting our email in the comments right now. Yeah, and the last thing that I'll just offer is that we, um, well, we do a lot clearly as we've kind of been sharing. Um, we do also work with um, individuals and organizations on building their climate justice practice in various ways. Um, so if you're interested in collaborating, drop us a line. Um, we, you know, Green New Theater is a real, we want it to be, we want to be in partnership. We want it to serve the field. Um, I mean, also a lot of things that we're talking about are like sometimes really tricky to dive into. Um, and so we're, we're really open to working with folks in a lot of different ways because we so want to move things forward with you. Excellent. And I just want to say uh, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us and, and do really uh, taking the time to break it down with us. Um, thank, I want to say thank you on behalf of Producer Hub and thank you personally. Uh, always fun to hang out with the Groundwater Ladies and with everyone who took their Friday night to hang out with us. Thank you for listening at home. If you haven't already, uh, please check out producerhub.org, subscribe, stay up to date, not only on what we're doing, but what on Groundwater is doing because they are one of our sponsored organizations. Um, and other than that, I just want to say thank you and good night to everyone.